Armageddon. The very thought sends shivers up and down the spine of the believer. On that day, the Lord is going to descend from heaven with the armies of heaven, and he is going to crush the armies of the nations in the valley of Armageddon. He's going to crush them in the winepress of the fury of his wrath. But this raises a question. Will the church fight alongside the Lord Jesus on that day, or is the church just along for the ride? If you want this question answered from the statements of Scripture, stay tuned. Hi there, I'm Lee Brainerd. Welcome to Soothkeep and another edition of Prophecy in the Crucible. My mission is truth, particularly truth in the prophetic arena. Truth at any cost, truth above every other consideration. Now today we're going to look at the question of whether or not the church actually fights with the Lord on the day and in the battle of Armageddon. Now many people today teach on the basis of Revelation 19.15, that the church is merely an observer at Armageddon. Here in this verse we read, And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now in their understanding, the Lord is going to use the sword of his mouth to smite the nations. In other words, he's going to smite the nations with his immediate creative word. The word of his power, as we read in Hebrews 1, verse 3. In their estimation, the Lord is the only actor. He doesn't need man's help. He won't be enjoying man's help. He is going to trample the winepress all by himself. Now, I grant that this point sounds plausible, but folks, plausibility cannot and does not survive the crucible of the scriptures. And right here, we're coming to the bedrock of my ministry, which is the authority of scripture. We want to base our beliefs on the entire testimony of scripture on the subject. We want to base our beliefs on a robust examination of the entire testimony of Scripture on a subject. We don't want to base our beliefs on a proof text or two with a gloss or two. Now, glosses are the official or the scholarly interpretation of a passage. But we want the interpretation of a verse that has the light of all the other passages of Scripture on the subject that tell us what the passage we're looking at must mean, and it, and it eliminates possibilities, and it requires some possibilities. And folks, glosses, these official interpretations of Scripture, they are regularly trashed by the plain statements of Scripture. So what does the Bible teach on this subject? Well, let's start by looking at Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And as is my common practice, I'm not going to read through the entire passage. We're just going to look at the snippets in the passage that pertain to the immediate question at hand. So starting at verse 1, we read, The day of the Lord comes, it is nigh at hand. A great people and a strong, there has never been the like, neither shall there be any more after it even to the years of many generations. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. Notice the phrase, nothing shall escape them. Now drop down to verse 7. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one, on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Drop down to verse 8. When they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Did you catch that? This army, when it falls upon the sword, shall not be wounded. This can't be any army but the glorified army of heaven. No other army prior to this or after this is ever going to meet that qualification. Verse 9. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run... Upon the wall, they shall run, climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. 
Before them the earth shall quake, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for strong is the force that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Notice that nothing shall escape this army, escape them. Notice further that they execute the Lord's word. In other words, they execute the Lord's commands. Now let's turn to Isaiah chapter 13, verses 3 through 13, and we're going to start in verse 3. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. Folks, this isn't an earthly army. They rejoice in the Lord's highness. Drop down to verse 5. They come from a far country from the end of heaven. The Lord and the weapons of his indignation. Did you catch that? The weapons of his indignation. To destroy the whole land. Verse 6. Howl for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Verse 9. Behold the day of the Lord comes. Cruel both with wrath and fierce anger. To lay the land desolate. And he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of the heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in its going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. So in this passage we saw very clearly that this army is regarded as the weapons of God's indignation. And he is going to use them to destroy the earth. Well, let's look at Psalm 149 verses 5 through 9. Let all the saints be joyful in glory. Go to verse 6. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Verse 7. To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. Drop down to verse 9. To execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all the saints. Praise the Lord. Did you catch that? This body is going to execute vengeance and execute judgment. Finally, let's look at Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 through 27. And he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power or authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. Did you notice? The church is going to bear a rod of iron, just like the Lord Jesus Christ. And they, beginning at Armageddon, are going to use this rod. And it's at Armageddon that they shatter the nations. Folks, the nations are not shattered during the millennium. They're shattered at the second coming. And then that brokenness and humility is maintained by the legal government of the kingdom during the entire thousand years. Now, there are many other verses which we could point to which address saints fighting in the day of the Lord. Most of them very specifically mention the nation of Israel. But that's another video. So let's summarize the evidence that we've looked at. In Joel chapter 2, verse 6, we saw that nothing is going to escape the heavenly army. In Joel 2, 11, we saw that the heavenly army is a mighty force or a strong force that executes the Lord's commands. In Isaiah 13, 5, we saw that this army is regarded as the weapons of the Lord's indignation. In Psalm 149, verse 7, we saw that this army is going to execute vengeance. And in Psalm 149, verse 9, we saw that this army is going to execute judgment. Now, this raises a question. How are we going to reconcile the testimony of Revelation 19.15 with the passages that we just examined? Revelation 19.15 says, if you recall, And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. So how do we reconcile these two things? 
First of all, the challenge that these verses raise is not a challenge to the testimony of Revelation 19.15. The challenge that they raise is to the interpretation and application of Revelation 19.15. And folks, the answer to this whole conundrum is simply this. The sword of the Lord that comes out of his mouth is much bigger than his immediate creative word. It includes his commanding word. It includes every expression of his sovereignty and his providence. It includes putting a hook in the jaw of Babylon and using her as a vessel of judgment or a tool of judgment to thresh Israel. It includes his work through angels and men that are submitted to his will. It includes his heavenly army following his express commands in the Battle of Armageddon. And secondly, it is beside the point that the Lord doesn't need the church's help to execute judgment when he tramples the winepress of the wrath of God at Armageddon. It's obvious that he doesn't need the church's help, but it's also obvious that God has undertaken almost everything that he's done down here on earth in the entire program of his dealings with man. He's done almost all of it through men. For instance, he used judges in the times of the judges. He used prophets, priests, and kings in the Mosaic era. He used apostles and prophets when he laid the foundation of the church. He used a, he's using currently evangelists and pastors and teachers as he does his work in the church age through the church. In fact, he still uses apostles and prophets in a secondary sense. And he's going to use glorified humans, both Old Testament saints and New Testament saints, as his co-regents and administrators in his thousand-year kingdom. So, and, and on top of that, he used human beings as instruments of judgment in the Old Testament times, during the earthly economy. So, taking all these points into consideration, why would he not use human instruments as instruments of judgment in the day of the Lord, when he establishes the kingdom? The simple answer is, of course he's going to use human agents. He almost always uses human agents, and this situation is no different. And therefore, we can trust the testimony and the passages that we examined at face value. So, in conclusion, I trust that this little Bible study has been helpful not only to help folks get a better handle on the question of the church's involvement in the Battle of Armageddon, but also to encourage them in the practice of being a Berean and looking to the entire counsel of God on a particular doctrinal question and not just trusting the experts when they point to a verse and give us a gloss. So folks, keep your eyes on the skies. We are going home soon. Eyes wide open, brain engaged, heart on fire. We'll see you next time.